In this lesson, we will talk about system virtualization. It's another important component of the system software stack that's involved in the management of the physical resources. We will explain what is virtualization and why it is important, and we will discuss what are some of the key technical approaches that are part of popular virtualization solutions, such as Xen and KVM and VMware CSX. In addition, at the end of the lesson, we will discuss what are some of the hardware advances that have occurred over the last decade in response to virtualization trends, specifically in the context of the x86 architecture. A lot of the content in this lecture is also summarized in a paper by Rosenblum and Garfinkel, Virtual Machine Monitors, Current Technologies, and Future Trends. Note that this is a paper from 2005, so much more has happened in the virtualization space than what this paper describes but it can still serve as a useful reference. Virtualization is an old idea. It originated in the 60s at IBM when the norm of computing was that there were a few large mainframe computers that were shared by many users and many business services. In order to concurrently run very diverse workloads on the same physical hardware, without requiring that a single operating system be used for all of the applications for all of the possible purposes, it was necessary to come up with a model where multiple operating systems can concurrently be deployed on the same hardware platform. With virtualization, each of the operating systems that are deployed on the same physical platform has an illusion that it actually owns the underlying hardware resources or at least some smaller portion of them. For instance, the operating system may think that it owns some smaller amount of memory compared to the memory that's actually available on the physical machine. Each operating system, together with its applications, as well as the virtual resources that it thinks it owns, is called a virtual machine, or a VM for short. This represents a virtual machine because it is distinct from the physical machine that is natively managed by some software stack. Virtual machines are often referred to as guests, uh, such as guest VMs, or also referred to as domains, like a guest domain, for instance. To support the coexistence of multiple virtual machines on the same physical machine requires some underlying functionality in order to deal with the allocation and the management of the real physical hardware resources. In addition, it's necessary to provide some isolation guarantees across these VMs. This is provided by the virtualization layer that is referred to as virtual machine monitor or hypervisor also. There are multiple ways in which the functionality that's required by the virtualization layer can be designed and implemented. And in this lesson, we will describe some of the key virtualization-related techniques. A formal explanation of virtualization is given in an old paper by Popek and Goldberg from 1974. There is a link to that paper in the instructor's notes. We'll go through the ideas that are presented in that paper, and we will explain how to define virtualization. The definition states that a virtual machine is taken to be an efficient, isolated duplicate of the real machine. Virtualization is enabled through a virtual machine monitor, or VMM. This is the layer that enables virtual machines to exist. As a piece of software, the virtual machine monitor has three essential characteristics. The virtual machine monitor provides an environment for programs that's essentially identical with the original machine. As I said, the capacity may differ. However, it would be the same kind of CPU that the virtual machine thinks it has, the same types of devices, etc. What this means is that as the, one of the goals of the virtual machine monitor is that it must provide some fidelity that the representation of the hardware that's visible to the, in the virtual machine matches the hardware that's available on the physical platform. Second, programs that run in this environment show at worst only minor decrease in speed. Now, clearly, we have a situation where the operating system and its processes in the virtual machine are given only two CPUs as opposed to the four that are available on the physical machine. This won't execute exactly at the same level. It won't be able to complete the programs as fast as if they ran natively. However, the goal of the virtual machine monitor is that if the virtual machine were given the exact amount of resources 
as the physical machine, then the operating system and the processes would be able to perform at the same speed. So another goal of the virtual machine monitor is to deliver performance to the VMs that's as close to the native performance as possible. And last, the VMM is in complete control of the system resources. This means that the virtual machine monitor has full control to make decisions who accesses which resources and when, and it can be relied upon to ensure safety and isolation among the VMs. This doesn't mean that every single hardware access has to be inspected by the VMM layer. Instead, what this means is that the virtual machine monitor determines if a particular VM is to be given direct hardware access, and also that once those decisions are put in place, a virtual machine cannot just change those policies and potentially hurt other co-located VMs. So one of the goals for the virtual machine monitor is that it has to provide for safety and isolation guarantees. Based on the classical definition of virtualization that's provided by Popek and Goldberg, which of the following do you think are virtualization technologies? The choices are VirtualBox, the Java Virtual Machine, and Virtual Game Boy, which allows you to run Nintendo Game Boy games on your computer. We have included links in the instructor notes in case you want to find out more about these choices. You should check all the answers that apply that are correct for this question. The only correct answer is VirtualBox, but let's talk about why. First, we must recognize that the goals of the system or platform virtualization are different than what's intended by the Java Virtual Machine or hardware emulator, as in the case of Virtual Game Boy. Remember that according to Popek and Goldberg, a virtual machine is an efficient isolated duplicate of the real machine. JVM is a language runtime which provides system services and portability to Java applications, but it's very different than the underlying physical machine. Also, emulators like Virtual Game Boy, they emulate some hardware platform, the Game Boy platform, but again, this is very different than the hardware platform where this emulator is running. With system virtualization, as is in the case of VirtualBox, the Physical hardware that's visible to the virtual machine is identical, or at least very, very similar to the physical platform that actually is supporting the execution of the virtual box VM. So why do we care about virtualization? Well, first, it enables consolidation. And consolidation is this ability to run multiple virtual machines with their operating systems and applications on a single physical platform. Consolidation then leads to improved cost efficiency with fewer machines, with less space, potentially with fewer admins, and with fewer electrical bills, we will be able to run the same kind of workload. So consolidation delivers benefits because it allows us to decrease costs and also to improve the manageability of the system. In addition, with virtualization, once the operating system and its applications are nicely encapsulated in a VM and decoupled from the actual physical hardware, it becomes more easy to migrate the OS and the applications from one physical machine to another physical machine, or even to copy and clone them onto multiple physical machines at the same time. As a result, virtualization leads to mechanisms that are useful in order to provide greater availability of the services. Like, for instance, if we have an increase in the load, we can just uh, create multiple VMs and address that issue, so increase the availability of the system. And also to provide solutions that improve the reliability. For instance, if we detect that a particular hardware node is getting hot and likely will fail, we can just migrate those VMs onto some other physical node. There are other benefits to virtualization. For instance, because the OS and the applications are nicely encapsulated in a virtual machine, it becomes more easy to contain any kinds of bugs or any kinds of malicious behavior to those resources that are available to the virtual machine only and not to potentially affect the entire hardware system. Speaking of debugging in particular, virtualization has delivered some other benefits that it has become a very important platform for operating systems research. 
It lets systems researchers quickly introduce new operating system feature and test them in the OS that's encapsulated in a VM. And then they have ability to more quickly view the effects of that and debug it as opposed to a more traditional cycle, which would have included hardware restarts of the machines and then searches through the log files, so the error files, etc. Virtualization is also useful because it provides affordable support for legacy operating systems. With virtualization, it's no longer necessary to designate some hardware resources for some older operating system just because it's needed to run one particular application, for instance. Instead, that legacy OS and applications can be packaged in a virtual machine and then can be co-located, consolidated on the same hardware resources that support other VMs and other applications. And there are many other benefits to virtualization. These are some of the key ones, though. Let me ask a question now. If virtualization has been around since the 60s, why do you think it hasn't been used ubiquitously since then? Here are the possible choices. Virtualization was not efficient. Everyone used Microsoft Windows. Mainframes were not ubiquitous. Or other hardware was cheap. You should check all that apply. The correct answers to this question are that the fact that virtualization wasn't dominant technology all these years is that first mainframes weren't ubiquitous, and then other hardware was cheap. Majority of the companies did not necessarily run mainframe computers. They ran servers that were based on x86 architecture mostly. This was affordable, and it was always much simpler to just add new pieces of hardware then to try to figure out how to make multiple applications and multiple operating systems coexist on that same hardware platform. This trend of just buying more machines if you need to run a different kind of operating system to support different applications continued for a few decades, actually. Let me ask a second question now. If virtualization was not widely adopted in the past, what changed? Why did we start to care about virtualization all of a sudden? The choices are servers were underutilized, data centers were becoming too large, companies had to hire more system admins, or companies were paying high utility bills to run and cool the servers. You should check again all of the choices that apply. Using the model of just buying new hardware whenever there is a need to run a slightly different operating system or to support slightly different applications, in that process, data centers became too large. At the same time, some of these servers were really very underutilized. In fact, on average, the utilization rates in data centers were around 10-20% tops. So as a result, companies, now that they had to manage these large data centers with lots of machines, they had to hire more system admins. So this is a correct choice. And at the same time, they had to spend more money to host all of those machines, to power them so they had higher electric bills, to cool the data centers since the machines need to operate within certain temperature variability. So this was basically burning through their operating budget. The fact that all of these choices are correct also translated at the time of something like companies spending 70% of their IT budget on operating expenses versus on capital expenses, like actually buying new hardware or new software services. So then it became apparent that it was important to revisit virtualization technology as a mechanism for consolidating some of these workloads on fewer hardware resources that will be easier to manage them and more cost-effective to actually run them, and this is why the industry and the community overall revisited these solutions that were in existence for certain types of platforms for decades at the time. Before describing the technical requirements for virtualization, let's take a look at the two main virtualization models. The two popular models for virtualization are called bare metal or hypervisor based and hosted. They're also often referred to as type one for the hypervisor based model and type 2 for the hosted model for virtualization solution. The bare metal model is like what we illustrated before. A virtual machine monitor or a hypervisor is responsible for the management of the physical resources 
and it supports execution of entire virtual machines only. One issue with this model are devices. According to the model, the hypervisor must manage all possible devices, or stated differently, device manufacturers now have to provide device drivers not just for the different operating systems, but also for the different hypervisors that are out there. To eliminate this, the hypervisor model typically integrates a special virtual machine, like a service VM, that runs a standard operating system and has full hardware privileges to access and perform any kind of hardware manipulation, just like if it ran natively on the hardware. It is this privileged VM then that would run all of the device drivers and would have control over how the devices on the platform are used. The service VM also runs some other management tasks and configuration tasks that specifies exactly how the hypervisor would uh, share the resources across the guest VMs, for instance. This model is adapted by the Zen virtualization solution and also by the VMware's uh, hypervisor, the ESX hypervisor. Regarding Zen, both when it comes to the open source version as well as the version that's supported by Citrix, the Zen server, the VMs that run in the virtualized environment are referred to as domain. The privileged domain is called DOM0, and the guest VMs are referred to as DOM use. Zen is the actual hypervisor, and all of the drivers are running in the privileged domain in DOM0. So the management of all of the devices has to involve the execution of the drivers that are part of DOM0. Given that VMware and its hypervisors were first to market, VMware still owns the largest percentage of virtualized server cores. So the server cores run the ESX hypervisor. Given this fact, VMware is in a position to actually mandate from the vendors that they do provide the drivers for the different devices uh, that are going to be part of the hypervisor. Now, this is not as bad because this is really targeting the server part of the market space, and in servers and data centers, there are not going to be that many devices, or there are going to be relatively fewer devices compared to what you would see on your laptop or desktops or, in general, the client platform. To support a third-party community of developers, VMware actually also exports a number of APIs. So this is not just for the sake of the developers, but also for users when they want to configure exactly the kinds of policies that will be enforced by the hypervisor. And uh, in the past, uh, the ESX architecture was such that there was a um, control core, a control domain, if you will, that was based on a regular operating system that was based on Linux. But right now, all of the configuration-related tasks are configured via remote API. The second model is called the hosted model. In this model, at the lowest level, there is a full-fledged host operating system that manages all of the hardware resources. The host OS integrates a virtual machine monitor module that's responsible for providing the virtual machines with their virtual platform interface and for managing all of the context switches, scheduling, etc. As necessary, this VMM module will invoke drivers or other components of the host operating system as needed. This one benefit of this model is that it can leverage all of the services and mechanisms that are already developed for the host operating system. Much less functionality needs to be redeveloped for the VMM module in this manner. Also note that on this host operating system, you may run guest VMs through the virtual machine module, but you can also run native applications directly on the host operating system as you would in general. One example of the hosted model is KVM, which stands for kernel-based VM, that's based on the Linux operating system. The Linux host provides all aspects of the physical hardware management, and just like any regular OS, it can run directly regular Linux applications. The support for running guest virtual machines is through a combination of a kernel module, that's the KVM module, and a hardware emulator called QEMU. We said that the goal of virtualization is to provide identical hardware, so here this emulator is used as virtualizer, so it, it really matches the underlying hardware resources, the x86, Intel, or AMD. The support for running guest VMs in KVM 
is through a combination of a kernel module KVM and a hardware emulator QMU. Now we said that virtualization, the intent is to provide identical hardware, so this QMU emulator isn't emulating some bizarre hardware platform. Instead, it's used in what's called a virtualizer mode. So the resources that are available to the guest VM are actually the exact hardware resources from the physical platform, except that this virtualizer intervenes during certain types of critical operations, certain specific instructions, or when it needs to pass control to the KVM module and the host OS. One example of that would be any aspect of IO management, because all of the support for devices, the device drivers, are handled as part of the Linux operating system, the host OS. A huge benefit for KVM has been that it's able to really leverage all of the advances that are continuously being contributed to the large Linux open source community. Because of this, KVM can quickly adapt to new hardware features, new devices, new security, bugs, or similar things. In fact, the KVM module was originally developed as a Linux module in order to allow regular use of Linux applications to take advantage of some of the virtualization-related hardware that started appearing in commodity platforms. All of a sudden, users realized that this can be useful to actually run guest operating systems and regular virtual machines. And so three months later, KVM was an actual virtualization solution that was part of the mainstream Linux kernel. For a quiz, I would like you to do a quick survey of some virtualization products. The question that you need to answer is, do you think that the following virtualization products are based on bare metal or hypervisor-based virtualization or host OS-based virtualization? The products you need to look at are KVM, Fusion, VirtualBox, VMware Player, VMware ESX, Citrix Zen Server, and Microsoft Hyper-V. And you should mark HV for hypervisor-based solutions or OS if you think the solution is host OS-based. As we stated earlier, VMware's ESX and the uh, Citrix Zen server are both hypervisor-based solutions. So is Microsoft Hyper-V. All of the other products are hosted. However, it's important to note that at KVM, the host OS switches to a, a mode, a module, in order to assume a hypervisor-like role. So the rest of the operating system really plays a secondary supporting role like, like a privileged partition. So before we go any further, let me ask you one question based on what we've learned so far. Which of the following do you think are virtualization requirements? Here are some possible choices. Present a virtual platform interface to the guest VM. Provide isolation across the guest VM. Protect the guest operating system from the applications that are running in the VM protect the hypervisor or the virtual machine monitor from the guest operating system. Among these choices, you should check all of the ones that apply. If you've marked all of these as correct answers, then you're correct. And I'll explain why. First, at the lowest level, we said that the virtual machine monitor must provide guest VMs with a virtual platform interface to all of the hardware resources, the CPU, the memory, the devices, so this clearly is a requirement. Obviously, the virtual machine monitor will have to isolate guest VMs from one another. And this actually can be pretty easily achieved using the similar kinds of mechanisms that are used by operating systems to provide isolation across the guest VM. So the hypervisor will use techniques or the virtual machine monitor will use techniques like preemption, will take advantage of hardware support in the memory management unit so that it can perform validations and translations of memory references pretty quickly. So there are opportunities to achieve this requirement efficiently using the existing methods and the existing hardware support. Also, within the virtual machine at the topmost level of the stack, the virtualization solution must continue to provide the ability to protect the guest operating system from faulty or malicious applications. We don't want a single application when it crashes to take the entire guest OS down. What this means is that somehow we have to have separate protection levels for the applications and for the guest OS. 
So these expectations that exist when the guest OS is executing natively on the physical platform, they must continue to be valid in the virtualized environment. At the same time, the virtualization solution has to have mechanisms to protect the virtual machine monitor from the guest operating system. We don't want a single faulty or malicious guest OS to bring down the hypervisor and the entire machine. What this means is that we cannot have a solution in which the guest operating system and the virtual machine monitor run at the same protection level. They have to be separated. When thinking about how to address the virtualization requirements that we just mentioned in the previous quiz, it is fortunate to observe that commodity hardware actually has more than two protection levels. Looking at the architecture that's at least in the server space most dominant, the x86 architecture, there are four protection levels called rings. Ring 0 has the highest privilege and can access all of the resources and execute all hardware supported instructions. And this is where, in a, in a native model, the operating system would reside. So when the OS is in control of all the hardware resources, it sits in ring zero. In contrast, ring three has the least level of privilege. So this is where the applications would reside. And whenever the applications try to perform something, some operation for which they don't have the appropriate privileges, then a trap would be caused and control would be switched to the ring zero to the lowest privilege level. One way in which these protection levels can be used is to put the hypervisor now in ring zero, so that's the one that has full control over the hardware, to leave the applications to execute at ring three level, and then the operating system would execute at ring one level. We'll explain how this actually works in the following video. More recent x86 architectures also introduce two different protection modes, called root and non-root. Within each of these modes, the four protection levels exist, so there are like two times these protection rings. Now, when running in root mode, all of the operations are permitted, all hardware is accessible, all instructions can be executed, so this is the highest privileged level, and this is the ring zero of the root mode, is where we would run the hypervisor. In contrast, in non-root mode, Certain types of operations are not permitted. So then the guest VMs would execute in this non-root mode, and they would have, as they did in native execution, their applications running in ring 3, and the operating system running at ring 0 privileged level. Attempts by the guest operating system to perform privileged operations cause traps that are called VM exits, and these trigger a switch to this root mode and pass control to the hypervisor. When the hypervisor completes its operation, it passes control back to the virtual machine by performing a VM entry, which switches the mode into non-root mode to ring zero so that the execution continues. Now that we understand how hardware-supported protection levels can be used, we can start explaining how virtualization techniques can be developed that achieve their goal to efficiently, at near native speeds, allow execution of virtual machines on top of these basically identical virtual platforms. First, guest instructions are executed directly by the hardware. That's important thing to know. The virtual machine monitor does not interfere with every single instruction that is issued by the guest operating system, or its applications for that matter. What this means is that just like the OS doesn't interfere on every single instruction and memory access, here the hypervisor does not interpose itself on every single operation and every single memory access performed by the guest. As long as the guest operating system and its applications operate within the resources that were allocated to them by the hypervisor, then everything is safe. The instructions in those cases will operate at hardware speed, and this will lead to efficiency of the virtualization solution. Whenever a privileged instruction gets accessed, then the processor causes a trap, and control is automatically switched to the most privileged level, so to the hypervisor. At this point, the hypervisor can determine whether the operation is to be allowed or not. If the operation is an illegal operation and it shouldn't be allowed, then the hypervisor can perform some action like to terminate the VMs. 
If the operation is, should be allowed, however, it's a legal operation, in that case, the hypervisor should perform the necessary emulation so that the guest operating system is under the impression that it actually does have control over the hardware. So from the guest perspective, it should seem as if the hardware did exactly what it was expected to do given the instruction. In reality, however, it was the hypervisor that intervened, that potentially executed a slightly different set of operations in order to achieve that emulation. This trap and emulate mechanism is a key method on which virtualization solutions rely in order to achieve efficient CPU virtualization. Although the trap and emulate model seems like it will solve all problems, and it worked beautifully on the mainframes, when uh, in the 90s the need to reapply virtualization solutions to the prevalent x86 architecture came up, it turned out that there were certain problems with this model. At the time, x86 platforms had just the four rings. There wasn't any support for root or non-root mode. And so the way to virtualize them would be to run the hypervisor in ring 0 and the guest OS in ring 1. However, it turned out that there were exactly 17 instructions that were privileged in that hardware would not allow them to be executed if they're not issued from the most privileged ring 0. However, they did not cause a trap. Issuing them from another protection level, from ring 1 or above, wouldn't pass control to the hypervisor and instead would just fail silently. For instance, uh, enabling or disabling interrupts requires manipulating of a bit in a privileged flags register, and this can be done via the popf pushf instruction. However, when these instructions are issued from ring 1 in the pre-2005 architecture, they just fail and the instruction pipeline is allowed to continue to the next instruction. The problem with the situation that there is no trap is that since control isn't passed to the hypervisor, the hypervisor has no idea that the OS wanted to change the interrupt status. So the hypervisor will not do anything to change these settings, will not emulate the behavior that was required, that was intended with this instruction. At the same time, because the failure of the instruction was silent, the operating system, the guest OS, doesn't know that anything wrong happened. So the OS will continue its execution, assuming that correctly the interrupts were enabled or disabled as intended. So the OS will then go ahead and perform operations that, for instance, if interrupted, can leave it in corrupt or in deadlock state, which was intended to be avoided by uh, some manipulation of this flags register to disable interrupt. So clearly this is a major problem and makes this trap and emulate approach not applicable for these architectures. Let's explain the problem with some of these problematic instructions a little bit more via quiz. So we said that in the earlier x86 architectures, the CPU flags privileged register was accessed via instructions popf and pushf. And these instructions failed silently if they're not accessed from the most privileged ring, ring 0. This is where the hypervisor would reside. What do you think can occur as a result of this situation? The options are the guest VM could not request interrupts to be enabled. The guest VM could not request interrupts to be disabled. The guest VM could not find out what is the state of the interrupts enable disabled bit, or all of the above. The correct answer is all of the above. To perform any of these operations requires access to this privileged register and requires execution of these instructions. When these fail silently, the guest will assume that the request completed and may end up interpreting some other information that's on the stack incorrectly, as if that's the information that's provided by that register. So none of these will be successful. One approach that was taken to solve the problem with the 17 instructions was to rewrite the binary of the guest VM so that it never really issues any one of these operations. This process is called binary translation. This approach was pioneered by research at Stanford University by a group led by Professor Mendel Rosenblum, and subsequently, this was commercialized as VMware. Now, some 15 plus years and 30, 40 billion dollars later, VMware still owns by far the largest share of the virtualized cores in the server market. Rosenblum later received the ACM Fellow Award, and in the recognition, he was specifically credited for reinventing virtualization.
He served as VMware's chief scientist for about 10 years and now is back full-time at Stanford. Let me give you now a brief description of what binary translation actually is. A key thing to note is that the goal that's pursued by VMware is to run unmodified guest operating systems, meaning that we don't need to install any special drivers or policies or otherwise to change the guest OS in order to run in a virtualized environment. As a startup, they clearly couldn't tell Microsoft to modify Windows so that VMware can improve in its success rate. So this type of virtualization where the guest OS is not modified is called full virtualization. The basic approach consists of the following. Instruction sequences that are about to be executed are dynamically captured from the VM binary. And this is typically done in some meaningful granularity like a basic block such as a loop or a function. Now the reason that this is done dynamically versus statically, so upfront before any code is actually run, is because the exact execution sequence may depend on the parameters that are available at runtime. So it's input dependent. So you cannot really do all of this in an efficient way statically upfront. Or in some cases, you just cannot do it at all because you don't have the input parameters. So then you dynamically capture these code blocks and then inspect them to see whether any of these 17 infamous instructions is about to be issued. If it turns out that the code block doesn't have any of these bad instructions, it's marked as safe and allowed to execute natively at hardware speed. However, if one of the bad instructions is found in the code block, then that particular instruction is translated into some other instruction sequence that avoids the undesired instruction and in some way emulates the desired behavior. This can possibly be achieved even by bypassing a trap to the hypervisor. Certainly, binary translation adds overheads and a number of mechanisms are incorporated, specifically in the VMware solution, in order to improve the efficiency of the process. These things include mechanisms such as uh, caching code fragments that correspond to the translated basic blocks so that the translation process can be avoided in the future. Also, the steps like distinguishing which portions of the binary should be analyzed, for instance, distinguishing between the kernel and the application code and making sure that the kernel code is the one that's analyzed, and various other optimizations. A very different approach is to give up on the goal of running unmodified operating systems. Instead, the primary goal is to offer a virtualization solution that offers performance and avoid some of the overheads that may be associated with any of the complexities that are necessary to support unmodified guests. In contrast to full virtualization, this is called para-virtualization. With para-virtualization, the guest OS is modified so that it now knows that it's running in a virtualized environment on top of a hypervisor as opposed to on top of native physical resources. A para-virtualized guest OS will not necessarily try to directly perform operations which it knows that they will fail, and instead it will make explicit calls to the hypervisor to request the desired uh, behavior, or specifically the desired hardware manipulation. These calls to the hypervisor are called hypercalls, and they behave in a way that's similar to the way system calls behave in an operating system. So the unprivileged guest OS here that's modified will package all relevant information about its context, its current state, and it will specify the desired hypercall. And at that point, it will issue the hypercall and that will trap to the virtual machine monitor. When the hypervisor completes the operation, control will be passed back to the virtual machine, to the guest, and any data, if appropriate, will be made available to it. This approach of para virtualization was originally adopted and popularized by the Zen hypervisor, this was a popular virtualization solution and originally was an open source hypervisor that started as a research project at University of Cambridge in the UK. This was later commercialized as ZenSource and ZenSource is now owned by Citrix. But there still remains a lot of activity in the open source Zen project, including at our own research group here. One thing to note, however, is that the open source uh, Zen version and the Citrix Zen version have uh, diverged perhaps substantially over time. Let me ask a question now. Which of the following do you think will cause a trap and will exit the VM and pass control to the hypervisor for both binary translation and for para-virtualized VMs? 
The options are access to a page that has been swapped or update to a page table entry. The first option is correct. If a page is not present, it will be the hardware MMU that will fault and it will pass control to the hypervisor regardless of the virtualization approach. For the second option, update to a page table entry, this is not always true. It really depends on whether the OS has write permissions for the page tables that it uses or not. We'll see in the next videos how this can be handled. So far we've focused on explaining the basics of how to virtualize efficiently the CPU, but let's now look at the other types of resources, looking at memory first. We will explain how memory virtualization can be achieved for the two basic virtualization approaches, whether it's um, based on full virtualization or requires guest modification. And we will talk about full virtualization first. For full virtualization, a key requirement is that the guest operating system continues to observe a contiguous linear physical address space that starts from physical address zero. This is what an operating system would see if it actually owned the physical memory and ran natively on physical hardware. To achieve this, we distinguish among three types of addresses. Virtual addresses, so these are the ones that are used by the applications in the guest. The physical addresses, these are the ones that the guest thinks are the addresses of the physical resource. And the machine addresses, these are the actual machine addresses, so the actual physical addresses on the underlying platform. The similar distinction of virtual versus physical versus machine will also apply to the page numbers and the page frame numbers. So given this, the guest operating system can continue to make mappings of virtual addresses to the physical addresses that it thinks it owns. And then underneath that, the hypervisor will then take these physical addresses that the guest believes are the real ones and map them to the real machine addresses. So in a sense, there are two page tables, one that's maintained by the guest operating system and another one that's maintained by the hypervisor. Now remember that at the hardware level, we have a number of mechanisms, the memory management unit, uh, uh, TLB, uh, caching of the address translations, that these mechanisms help with the address translation process, make it much more efficient, and don't require us in software to repeatedly perform address translations and validation. Now this option that we discussed so far will require that every single memory access goes through two separate translations. The first one, which will be done in software, and then the second one potentially can take advantage of hardware resources like CLB, because the hardware will understand only this page table. Clearly, this will be too expensive, since this will add overhead on every single memory reference. It will slow down the ability to run at near-native hardware speed. The second option is for the hypervisor to maintain a shadow page table in which it actually looks at what are the virtual addresses that the guest has mapped to these physical addresses. And then in the shadow page table, it directly establishes a mapping between the virtual addresses that are used by the guest and the machine addresses that are used by the hypervisor, by the physical hardware. Then if the hardware MMU uses this page table, the guest operating system is allowed to execute natively using the applications will use virtual addresses. And these will directly be translated to the machine addresses that are um, used by the physical hardware. The hypervisor will clearly have to be responsible to maintain consistency between these two page tables. And it will have to employ mechanisms that, for instance, invalidate what is the currently valid page table, shadow page table, whenever there is a, a context switch or to write protect the guest page table in order to keep track of new mappings that the guest operating system installs and similar mechanisms. This right protection is necessary so that whenever the guest OS tries to install new virtual to physical address mapping in the page tables that are used by the guest, this will cause a trap to the hypervisor, and then the hypervisor will be able to pick up that virtual address and then associate the corresponding machine address and insert this mapping into the page table that is used by the hardware MMU. This can be done completely transparently to the guest operating system. In contrast, in para-virtualized systems, the operating system knows that it's executing in a virtualized environment. 
Because of this, there is no longer a strict requirement for the guest OS to use contiguous physical memory that starts at zero. And the guest OS can explicitly register the page tables that it uses with the hypervisor, so there is no need for maintaining dual page tables, one at the guest and then another shadow one at the hypervisor level. Now, the guest still doesn't have write permissions to this page table that's now used by the hardware, because otherwise the guest potentially can uh, establish any mapping and corrupt other VMs that are running on the same system. So because of that, every update to the page table would cause a trap and pass control to the hypervisor, but because the guest is para-virtualized, then we can modify the guest and do tricks like batch a number of page table updates and then issue a single hypercall in this case to uh, tell the hypervisor to install all of these mappings. So this can amortize the cost of the exit across multiple operations. There can be other optimizations that are useful. For instance, optimizations related to how the memory is managed so that it's more friendly to execution in a virtualized environment um, or so that it's more cooperative uh, with respect to other VMs in the system and other things. One thing to note that the two mechanisms that I described with respect to memory virtualization for both full as well as para-virtualized VMs have substantially been improved uh, given advances in the new hardware architecture. So some of these overheads have completely been eliminated or at least substantially reduced if we take a look at what's happening at the newer generation of x86 platforms. And we will talk about that shortly in this lesson. When we talk about virtualization, when we look at CPUs and memory, certain things are relatively less complicated in spite of everything that we said so far because there is a significant level of standardization at the instruction set architecture across different platforms. So then from a virtualization standpoint, we know that we have to support a specific ISA, and then we don't care if there are lower level differences between the hardware, because it's up to the hardware manufacturers to be standardized at the ISA level. This clearly is the case for a particular ISA, for instance, for uh, x86. It, things will be different across x86 and, for instance, MIPS platforms. When we look at devices, however, there is a much greater diversity in the types of devices, if we compare that to the types of uh, CPU instruction sets. And also there is lack of standardization uh, when it comes to the specifics of the device interface and the semantics of that interface. So what is the behavior when a particular call is, uh, is invoked? How a particular device should respond to a call to send a packet, for instance. To deal with this diversity, virtualization solutions adapt one of three key models uh, to virtualize devices. We will describe these models next and note that they were developed before any virtualization-friendly hardware extensions were made to the um, CPU architectures and the chipsets. And these uh, new modifications of the hardware make some aspects of device virtualization much simpler than, uh, than what originally it was when uh, these models were first introduced. One model is the so-called pass-through model. The way the pass-through model works is that the VMM level driver is responsible for configuring the access permissions for a device. For instance, it will allow a guest VM to have access to the memory where the control registers for the device are mapped. There are clearly benefits to this approach. One is, for instance, that the guest VM has uh, exclusive access to a particular device. It's the only one that can manipulate its state, that can control it, and it's the only one that will use it. Also, the VM's accesses to the device completely bypass the hypervisor, so their direct accesses to the device. This model is also called the VMM bypass model. Now, clearly, once we start providing VMs with exclusive access, figuring out a way to share devices will become difficult. We'll basically have to continuously reassign which particular VM uh, it can access a particular device over time, but the sharing will not happen simultaneously, concurrently. That, in some cases, is, is really not doable because of uh, limitations of the device. In other cases, it can be done, but it will be very uh, high overhead operations. So in practice, uh, really, device sharing with this model is not feasible. 
Now, because the hypervisor is completely out of the way, it means that the guest VM and the device driver that's in the guest VM directly operates and controls the particular physical device. So that means that when we're launching this guest VM, there better be a device of the exact same type as expected by the guest OS on the physical machine. In some cases, maybe in the server space, that's not as critical of a requirement just because there are fewer types of devices that are commonly present there. But in other environments, this is really not a practical constraint. Remember, we're not talking about the fact that there needs to be a network interface or a disk uh, um, device or hard disk device. We're talking about the exact same particular type of network card or hard disk drive that the guest VM expects, um, depending on the device drivers that it has. Also, we mentioned that one of the benefits of virtualization is that the guest VMs are decoupled from the physical hardware, and therefore we can migrate them easily to other nodes in the system. Well, this pass-through really breaks that decoupling because it directly binds a device to a VM. This makes migration difficult, in particular because there may be some a device specific state and potentially even device resident state that would also need to be copied and migrated and then properly configured at the destination node. And then basically that turns VM migration not in a hypervisor and VM specific operation, but it needs to be implemented in a way that knows how to deal with the device specifics of all of the particular devices that are of interest. The second model for providing virtualization of physical devices is to allow the hypervisor to first intercept every single possible device access that's performed by a guest VM. Once the hypervisor has the information about the device operation that the guest VM wanted to perform, it doesn't have a requirement that the uh, device that the guest VM wants and the physical device match. So the hypervisor would first translate that device access to some generic representation of an I operation for that particular family of devices, whether they're network devices or disk devices. And then it will traverse the um, hypervisor resident, the VMM resident uh, IO stack. So the bottom of that stack is the actual real device driver, and the hypervisor will invoke that device driver and perform the I operation on behalf of the guest VM. Clearly, a key benefit of this approach is that now the virtual machine is again decoupled from the physical device. Any translation, any emulation will be performed by the hypervisor layer. And because of that, operations such as sharing and migration or the requirements of how we need to deal with device specifics, all of that becomes uh, simpler in a sense. This is a model that's originally adapted by the VMware ESX hypervisor. The downside of the model is that it clearly adds latency on device accesses because of this emulation uh, step. And then also, it requires that the device driver ecosystem is in certain ways integrated with the hypervisor. Now, the hypervisor needs to support all of the drivers so that it can uh, uh, perform the necessary operations. And the hypervisor is then exposed to all of the complexities of and bugs of various device drivers. Again, we said earlier, in the case of VMware, because of its market share, this model was a reasonable model, and it made sense, and it's been sustainable because of that. A third model to device virtualization is the so-called split device driver model. This model is called split because all of the device accesses are controlled in a way that involves both a component that resides in the guest virtual machine and also a component that resides in the hypervisor layer. Specifically, device accesses are controlled uh, using a uh, device driver that sits in the guest VM called the front-end device driver. And then the actual driver for the physical device that uh, is the regular device driver that's used by operating systems when they run natively. And this backend driver, referred to as backend, uh, resides in uh, the service VM in the case where we have a, a virtualization model that involves a service VM or the host operating system in the case of type 2 virtualization. The point is that this backend should really be just the regular device driver that um, the service, the Linux OS, for instance, and the service VM would just uh, be able to install and use, uh, even if it's not running in a virtualized environment. 
Now, although this back-end driver does not necessarily have to be modified, the front-end driver has to be modified because it explicitly needs to take the device operations that are made by the applications in the guest and then put them together in something that looks like a, a special message that will directly be passed to this back-end component that's in the service VM. So this approach essentially applies only to pair of virtualized guests that will be able to explicitly install these special front-end device drivers. What these really are, they look like wrappers for the actual device API. So the applications potentially, they don't have to be modified. They will continue making the same kinds of requests for device operations, but this front-end device driver will treat these operations specially, will not attempt to actually issue uh, accesses to the physical device. Instead, will create messages that will get passed to the service VM. One benefit of the approach is that it can eliminate uh, the overheads that are associated with device simulation that the previous model required. Now, we don't have to reverse engineer exactly what the guest OS is trying to do. The guest OS, via its front-end device driver, explicitly tells the virtualization layer, so overall these two components, what exactly is it that the guest VM requires. Another more subtle benefit of the approach is that now that we have this um, back-end component that's uh, centralized in that it will re accept requests from all of the guest VMs in the system and then try to decide which one of those gets to execute the physical uh, device access. Now, there are some opportunities for some better uh, management of the shared device accesses, so to enforce some finer grain uh, policies regarding fairness, regarding priorities, and those sorts of things. The solutions that we described on how to virtualize memory and I.O. clearly indicate that there is some degree of complexity and overheads that have to be incurred by the, uh, due to virtualization. Given the wide recognition that virtualization delivers important benefits, and as we pointed out earlier in this lesson, in that it presented an important path to address some of the issues related to rising operating costs uh, in the IT industry, the hardware companies responded and they modified their architectures in a way that makes them more appropriate for virtualization. In the x86 world, these virtualization-friendly architectures started appearing around 2005 with AMD Pacifica and Intel's Vanderpool Technology, or Intel VT for short. With respect to x86, uh, one of the first things that was fixed was to close the holes with respect to those 17 non-virtualizable instructions so that they will cause a trap and pass control over in a privileged mode. Also, the new protection mode uh, was introduced. So as opposed to having just one protection mode with four rings, now there are two protection modes, root and non-root also referred to as host, because this is root is the mode in which the host operating system, the hypervisor, would run, and the non-root that's also referred as guest, which is where the guest VM would run. Also, support was added for the processor, the hardware processor, to understand and to be able to interpret information that describes the state of the virtual processors called vCPUs. This information is captured in a VM control structure, or also called a VM control block in the AMD x86 architecture. The fact that the hypervisor understands how to interpret this data, so it can walk this data structure is the term that's commonly used, means that uh, you can specify um, whether or not a system call should trap, so it's easy for the hypervisor to know that a particular type of operation should not cause a trap into root mode and instead should just be handled by the privilege layer in the non-root mode. So the privileged layer in the non-root mode is the operating system. And other pieces of information then, uh, that in a certain way can help reduce the virtualization overhead. The next step uh, in terms of virtualization related advances was to make it easier to manage memory. Since hardware was already able to understand the presence of different VMs, the next step here involves tagging the memory structures used by the hypervisor with the corresponding VM identifiers. So this led to support for extended page tables, where the page table entries now include information about the VM ID, 
and also tag TLB. What this means is that if there is a context switch among VMs, that's also called the world switch when we're switching from one VM to another, we don't have to flush or invalidate those entries that are in the TLB that belong to the previous VM. This is because the MMU, when it performs a check uh, against the TLB entries, will try to match both the virtual address that's causing the access request as well as the uh, VM identifier. And if they both match, then it will proceed with the address that's specified in the uh, TLB entry. Otherwise, it will deal with the page fault failures. As a result, context switches are now much more efficient. Hardware was also extended to add better support for IO virtualization, and this included modifications both to the processor and the chipset side, and also device and system interconnect capabilities that were introduced in order to support this. Some examples of these features include things like multi-queue capabilities on the device, and you can think of this as the device having multiple logical interfaces where each interface can be used by a separate VM, and also better support of interrupt routing so that when a device needs to deliver an interrupt to a specific VM, it actually interrupts the core where that VM is executing and not some other CPU. Additional virtualization-related hardware features will also include it for stronger security guarantees that now can be made to the VMs, and also to protect VMs from one another, as well as from the hypervisor, and also features for um, better management support or for um, more efficiently to be able to perform various management operations in virtualized environments. You can think of this as more virtualization-friendly management interfaces. Also, a number of new instructions were added to x86 in order to actually exercise all of these new features. For instance, a new instruction was introduced to transition from one mode to another, basically to transition to root mode or to return control to non-root mode, or a new instructions to uh, manipulate in certain ways the uh, state that's um, in the per VM control data structure, et cetera. Let me ask a question now. With hardware support for virtualization, guest VMs can now run unmodified and can have access to the underlying devices. Given this, what do you think? Is the split device driver model still relevant? Answer either yes or no. The answer to this is yes, because with the split device driver model, we are consolidating all of the requests for device access to the service VM where we can make better decisions and enforce stronger policies in terms of how the device is shared without perhaps relying to specific support for desired behavior, for desired sharing behavior on the actual physical device. And finally, I'd like to show you this illustration from Intel that summarizes the advances in the Intel VT architecture over the last decade or so. The lowest set of boxes summarize the impact of the virtualization-related hardware modifications that have been added along the three different dimensions. The three dimensions are as follows. Vector 1 refers to any CPU-related modifications, and this includes things like fixing issues with non-virtualizable instructions or adding support to the CPU for extended page table. Vector 2 refers to modifications pertaining to the entire chipset, such as chipset side support for technologies um, like uh, what's called SRIOV, that uh, technologies that help with IO virtualization, or for IO routing and uh, mechanisms for direct device access, or support rather for direct device access. And then the third vector, the third dimension in which uh, Intel has contributed to the evolution of virtualization friendly technology is to actually push advances in the device level technology. So this is what's happening on the device as opposed to on the, chip you, uh, on the chipset or the CPU side. And with this trust, devices are more easily integrated in a virtualized environment. This includes things like support on the device for DMA remapping so that it can appropriately DMA into the correct set of uh, memory, depending on the virtual machine that it targets, and to also support the 
multiple uh, queue, the multiple logical interfaces, uh, such that different logical interface can be given to a different uh, VM. The architecture versions that encapsulate these modifications are referred to as VTX for the modifications along the first vector, with uh, VTX2 and VTX3 occurring in subsequent generations of processors. Then VTD for the advances along the second dimension with VTD following and so forth. And then the architecture modifications uh, along the third vector are encapsulated into what's referred to as IOV, so IO virtualization technology, and VMDQ, what stands for virtual machine device queues. So this is device resident support. In this lesson, we explained what is virtualization and what are some of the main approaches that are used to virtualize physical platforms. We specifically described mechanisms for processor, memory, or device virtualization that either were or still are part of the dominant virtualization solutions such as Xen and KVM or the VMware products. In addition, we discussed some of the hardware advances that have occurred as a result of the need to efficiently virtualize the popular x86 platform. As a final quiz, please tell us what you learned in this lesson. Also, we would love to hear your feedback on how we might improve this lesson in the future.